take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Holy Father, help us today as we come to your holy word to learn, to grow, to change, to worship and adore you. You have sent your son to us. He has died for us. He has been risen for us, and he now intercedes for us before you. And he sent his Holy Spirit to us. And we all who have, who are your adopted sons through faith in Jesus Christ, we have his presence with us now. So we do not ask that your spirit would descend on this place because you have already, he has already been sent into our hearts. Instead, we ask today that he who is in us in a very real way, he who is in us would take the truths that come into our ears and into our minds today from your word and he would solidify and explain and, and uh, even, even to a, a sense interpret and change us as your people by these words. And whatever is needed, whether it's encouragement or rebuke, whether it's building up or maybe something needs torn down within us and among us as your body, may your spirit do his work today so that you would be praised, Jesus, for your work of redemption. It is in your name that we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> this text of scripture, we need to understand the entire context and it has been a little over a month since we've been studying in the book of Hebrews. I'm not going to take a lot of time to review what we're doing, but I do think it's important we kind of just take our minds back into chapter 12 before we get started here. Of course, the word that takes us back to the first part of chapter 12 is the very first word of our text, therefore. He's saying, there's things that I have said, now this is the application of these things. Now, therefore, this is how you should think, and there's a response that you have or ought to have because of what I have just been teaching you. So what has he been teaching us in Hebrews chapter 12? Well, the first thing he's been teaching us in Hebrews chapter 12 is that we are running a race, a spiritual race. We live this life, and it's difficult and as Christians, as those that profess the name of Christ, as those who are a part of his body, his, his church, we recognize that there are good days of joy and there are difficult days of grief and sorrow, pain from outside and sin from within, and we need endurance to run this race of faith. We must run with endurance. To do that... To run with endurance, we must cast aside the easily besetting sin. We must throw to the side. We must remove the obstacles of our fleshly nature which tries to trip us up and drives us further away from Christ, from Christ alone, from faith in him. We have a great cloud of witnesses, of representatives, of those who have gone before us, chapter 11, who've proved to us, yes, you can, by the grace of God, you can run this race of faith with endurance. They believe the promises of God, you can believe the promises of God. They put one foot in front of the other, you can put one foot in front of the other with this great cloud of witnesses. But we have ultimately the greatest example of one who ran with endurance, we have Jesus Christ, our Lord himself, who first of all is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who gives us faith, who implants it in us in the first place as a miracle of divine spiritual regeneration. He gives us faith, the author and finisher, but also he is this perfect example of faithful endurance. You see, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. It was a joy to him to run with endurance the race that the Father had set before him. And he is the example. So we must consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become discouraged and weary in your souls. And then the implication is, and thus do not run with endurance. 
And the key here is to embrace the trials and the struggles and the pains and the trauma, receiving it all with joy as Jesus did. Receiving it all with joy as the good and gracious plan of your Father in heaven. A Father who loves you too much to allow you to run this race undisciplined. Who will discipline you. And that discipline has a formative structure to it and a corrective structure to it. In the formation of who we are as we run this race of faith, we are being disciplined by the traumas and trials and struggles of life. We are, God is forming in us Christ's character, Christ's life through this discipline. But we also know that this discipline has must have and does have a very real corrective element to it because we do not often run with endurance the race that is set before us. We do not often look to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, and we do not often run, walk, and laying aside and pulling out those obstacles of sin out from us. And so your Father in heaven, he chastens you. He scourges every son whom he receives. It's evidence that he's received you, that you're his. And so he lovingly corrects you. And as the text says here, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. It is indeed painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of holiness, of righteousness, to those who have been trained by it, trained, exercised, disciplined by the corrective chastening of the Lord. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down. Therefore, because it's painful, because it's grievous, Because it hurts, but it's good. And we need trained in the discipline of Jehovah. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. This is, verse 12 and 13, our response or the necessary response. What we ought to have as our response to the discipline of the Lord, to the chastening of God on us. It's how we ought to respond to it, and that is to strengthen the hands that hang down, strengthen the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. Now, obviously, these three, weak hands, wobbly knees, crooked paths, these three are illustrative principles. These are, these are analogies for us. Now, what's interesting is if you read the whole paragraph, you see, okay, I see this, these analogies, these three illustrations, which tell me what I must do or how I must respond to the discipline of the Lord and to the, the race of faith, the endurance, the pain. You're running the race, and you're, 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 in, you're in mile 12 of the marathon, and you don't want to do mile 13. No, for some of us, we're in mile two of the marathon, and we don't want to do mile three. Whatever the case may be, the idea here is we, we, we were, we're done. And he gives these analogies, and he really is truly summing up or concluding this longer illustration of the race of faith. And that's why he uses these illustrative idea of weak knees and feeble hands and the paths not straight. It fits the race analogy very well that he's been talking about. But this text, this paragraph, also transitions toward the next thing he's going to talk about. Nearly all scholars say that verses 12 and 13 is a break between 14 through 17. But they're all a little bit unsure of how that break really goes because 12 and 13 also seems to set up the next section. 
So it seems to conclude one and set it up. And so you kind of think rather than a sharp division in topics, it's really one bleeding into the next. And that these function as a transition to the next kind of practical living of how we then live in this race of faith. Today I really want us to look at 12, 13, and 14. And 14 is kind of that main big switch or transition to the next one. Really, you could think of this, these two sermons this week and next week as the what and the how. 12 through 14, what we should do in light of the discipline of the Lord. And then 15 through 17, why, the what and how in 12 through 14. And 15 through 17, the why, and then once again, as he often does in Hebrews, a warning, a warning about it. Don't, but be careful of this. Very concerning. And he's going to actually say, be careful that you're amongst you, there isn't an Esau amongst you. And that's the warning. But let's think of these three illustrations to begin with. Weak hands, wobbly knees, feeble knees, and crooked path. Now when we think of this, these weak hands and kind of weak knees or the wobbly knees and the lack of path, especially those first two, the weak hands and wobbly knees, our minds usually go toward discouragement, toward sadness, depression. You know, the idea of you just lift up the hands that hang down and it's kind of like this, this kind of image of like just stooped over and just sad and really kind of lonely and upset. And, and weak knees often brings to mind people's mind like fear, you know, wobbly, knocking knees and sort of things. That may be appropriate uh, understanding of those terms uh, when we just think about them outside of a context that they're in. But that's not really what he's talking about. He's not really talking about being sad or discouraged in this text. This really isn't so much describing the defeated Christian as it is describing the defecting Christian. Remember, all of Hebrews has been a warning side by side with a, with a celebration of the superiority of Christ. There's been this warning side by side all through the book, don't defect, don't turn from this supreme Christ. And he's saying that same kind of thing here. The Puritan John Brown said it this way. I'm going to quote this short and then quote it at length later because it's really helpful. He says this, For the hands to hang down and the knees to be feeble, feeble are figurative expressions to denote a tendency to abandon the discharge of Christian duty. So he's not talking about people who are just sad or discouraged and say, oh, I'm just, I don't want to do this. He's talking about, be careful that you don't forsake Christ. That you don't abandon your Christian duty. Hanging or drooping hands. Literally in the Greek means loosening grip. Unresponsive anymore. In other words, what once he held, this individual held tightly to, the doctrines of Christ alone, what once he held tightly to, now his grip has loosened, his hands have become weak, and he, these doctrines, the truth, the gospel is soon to slip from his grasp. Whether it's weariness or distraction, because distraction is truly a tool that our enemy the devil uses to cause us to become weak in our hands. We just become distracted and we forget about these things that we once professed so clearly. Whatever the case, it's unclear, but the analogy for the faith that we once held dear now being held loosely in his hands as they just kind of forget and hang lower and slowly let go of it all. One who is nearing apostasy. Among the church, one who is nearing apostasy, soon to forsake the faith that he once pledged himself to as his hands just kind of roll it out. 
We've seen this all through the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 5. He is warning and warning about this danger of, of apostasy, of turning from Christ. And he always warns it and he always explains it in such a way that apostasy, that is rejection of Christ alone, happens in incremental turns. It's not all at once. It's incremental. And this illustration there is that the hands just are just kind of slowly forgetting about it. There's other things that have become more important. It's become difficult and more and more difficult to retain Christ as the center of things. And that's what he's referring to in the first illustration of weak hands, drooping hands. The second illustration is the feeble knees. Paraluo, where we get the word paralyzed from, is the word describing the knees here. Paralyzed knees. Knees that won't go, that won't take the next step, whether it's weariness or stubbornness of body. The third one, and I'm going to come back to the knee in just a moment, the third one is straight paths. You can see he's talking about the same thing in all three of these, is the imagery of a runner who has dodged boulders, jumped over logs, waded through mud, got stuck in the muck. And finally has said, what's the point? This is frustrating. I go 10 miles to go two. And so he says, straighten your path, remove the obstacles, put your focus and keep going. Run the race. Make your path straight. What should be done with the hands ready to loosen their grip on the doctrine of Christ alone and what should be done with the knees bending and buckling under the weight of Christian duty, of love and good works. He uses the same verb for both of those, restore, set up, rebuild, refresh, strengthen, to help the weak in knees and brace the wobbly knees. Now, I know a little something about wobbly knees. A few weeks ago, my wife and I went backpacking and it was a really nice trail, but there was one fairly steep portion of the trail as we went over a mountain pass. And hiking with about 30 to 40 extra pounds on one's back is not the easiest, when, especially when you're having to step up on rocks, big steps. At one point, I stepped up on a rock, and it was a weird feeling. And I, I've always had problems with my knees. I've always had issues with them. But it was a weird feeling as I stepped up and pushed down on my, on my foot. And my knee just essentially, I mean, if it had a mouth, it would have said, saying to me, uh, no, sir, <laughs> you are not doing that. And it just felt like this like pressure, like it was just going to just blow out the side. I didn't twist it, I hadn't damaged it, I hadn't done anything to it to make it hurt in any way, but it just essentially was saying, that's enough. That's enough, I'm not going the next step. And what I needed to do in that moment is I needed to, first of all, rest it, um, just take a moment, I need to be careful and attentive to it, but what really would have helped me in the moment if I hadn't forgot them at home were these braces that I wear on my knee. And I, I put this brace around it, and it adds strength to the weak knee. It adds strength to the buckling, paralyzed knee. And that brace provides the strength and structure that the knee alone cannot have. That is the imagery when he says, strengthen, refresh, brace up the wobbly knee. Strengthen, refresh, build up the weakened grip in the hands. Now think about this for a moment. He's not saying, and we see this through this, I'll, I'll try to show this in the text, the whole context, but I don't believe he's saying to an individual here in verse 12 and 13, he says, hey, when your hands begin to lose their grip, you just tighten them back up. When your knees begin to be wobbly, you just push through the pain. None of the commands that he has given 
to restore, rebuild, refresh, any of these words through the book of Hebrews have had an individual component to them. They've all had a corporate concept. The brace needs to come alongside the knee and hold it up. This hand is getting weak. This other hand needs to come and help hold it. You see, the commands to restore, strengthen, remove the obstacles, make straight paths for your feet is not to be taken primarily in the, in, in the individual sense, but in the corporate sense, all the pronouns are plural and reflexive in their understanding. Or to say it this way, you all do this. You all do this. You all strengthen the knees. You all strengthen the weakened hands. In other words, not every man for himself, but in the body of Christ, every member for the other. Help your brother grip his faith, he's loosening. Help your sister bear her weights, her knees are weakening, be the brace. Help your brother remove the obstacles causing them, as he says in the text, to come up lame from tripping over things. I'll continue this quote because this is what John Brown continues to say. For the hands to hang down and the knees to be feeble are figurative expressions to denote a tendency to abandon the discharge of Christian duty. That's the quote I mentioned before. This is what he says, continuing that. To lift up the hands and the feeble knees to support them as if it were by bandages bracing them is a figurative expression for be active and persevering in the discharge of duty. Rouse yourselves and each other to this activity and perseverance. Make straight paths for your feet. Proceed straight forwards in the discharge of Christian duty. Notwithstanding all difficulties, beware of turning aside in any degree that may lead to abandonment of the right way altogether. Proceed straight onward, let, onward lest that which is lame be turned away. That, that which is lame from among you be turned away. Remove the obstacles from yourselves and your brothers. Help push the boulders of unbelief and sin out of the way. Why? So that, that's a purpose statement, what is lame? Or the one person from among you who is coming up lame. That is, his grip has been loosening. His knees are giving out. That that person from among you who is coming up lame would not be dislocated, would not be out of joint from the rest of the body. That they would not be a member that must abandon the body because the body has braced them up. That they would not defect from the faith, rather that they, the lame ones among you, would be healed, healed of their potential apostasy. See, in the context, what he is saying is this is not a Bible verse that's intended, these verses not intended for us to say, okay, this is a good one for me to kind of just like work on. I need to try to strengthen my hands a little more. I need to just strengthen my knees a little bit. I need to just clear out some obstacles for my feet, but I can do it. And, and then when I come into the, the Sunday morning service or, or one of the equip groups, I say to people, they say, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And I just keep going on in what I'm doing. I just got to strengthen those hands. I just got to keep working at it. That's not at all the context. Not at all the concept. He's talking about the same sort of illustration that Paul the Apostle speaks of when he speaks of the whole body, each member supplying what is needed to the body. He's talking to the church here, not the individuals. And the question that arises, two questions really in my mind, is where are you at in this? Where am I at? Am I soon to be dislocated out of joint with the body because my grip is loosening and my knees are getting weak? And what's the point anyways? There's too many obstacles in the way. My job, my career, my family, the trials, sicknesses, governments, it's just so much there. The second question is, if that's where am I, where are you? The second question is, if you are still gripping the faith, 
how are you bracing up each other and those who may be coming up lame? Where are you coming along beside them? Where am I coming along beside? I believe this out of joint is truly an illustrative reference to excommunication in the body of Christ, to the abandonment of the faith that John spoke about when he said they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they surely would have continued with us. And like Paul speaks about in Corinthians when he says about the unrepentant man, and he says to him, when you gather together, remove that one from yourselves, deliver him over to Satan that he may learn not to blaspheme. I believe this out of joint is a reference to that, but the whole point of this text is that's a reluctant reality. Rather than look for opportunity to remove the disjointed, those coming up lame, do everything you can to keep them from getting there. Brace them, hold their grip when they can't grip it. Move the boulders out of the way so they don't come up lame and become dislocated. It was John Owen who noted the lame ones in the immediate context here are those who retained the Jewish ceremonies and worship alongside the teaching of the gospel. In other words, he's saying these are the the people in the context here that that are the ones that are saying, you know, Christ was great and all, but now there's a little persecution about it. Let's go back to Judaism. It's just, it's more comfortable. It's more comfortable. We know what we're doing with the sacrifices. In chapter 10, we read this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Weak in grip, wobbly knees. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Who are those who are forsaking the assembling of themselves together? Those who are becoming lame and soon to be dislocated out of joint. But exhorting one another, strengthen the hands. Strengthen the knees. Make straight paths for your feet. But exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. In chapter 3, we read something else about this. You see, we read this. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you or among you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, especially those whose grip of faith is loosening, whose faith needs bracing, who are discouraged with so many obstacles. Exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of of sin. In other words, lest any of you come up lame. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Do you see how has it been a constant theme through the book of Hebrews that he's speaking in the corporate sense all through Hebrews? The author calls the church to consider Christ as supreme. Christ is better. And don't turn from him. Don't go anywhere else. There is no other sacrifice for your sins. There is nothing else for you apart from Christ. Yet he constantly considers our loyalty to Christ not to be an individual assignment, but a group church-wide project. Grip your brother when he's losing his grip. Brace your sister when she's becoming weak. Remove the obstacles hindering enduring faith and obedience to Christ. Now let me just make a quick comment, and then we'll jump in the rest of this text and finish. That phrase, remove the obstacles. I fear with myself, that not only is it tempting for me to not help remove the obstacles for my brother's faith, but I find it very easy for me to become an obstacle myself. My tightly held opinions about extra biblical standards, kind of clothes people wear, musical style, political fury, Those, I find, can become obstacles. A a brother 
How, how do I know? How do I know that a brother or a sister is not coming into the assembly on Sunday morning saying, this is the last week I'm coming. This is the last time. I'm, I'm done. I, I don't even know what I think about Christ anymore. I don't know what I think about this gospel. And they come in and they want to sing and they want to pray and they just don't know where they're, what they're going to do next. They're, they're at the end. Their knees are wobbling. Their hands and grip is loosening. And as a Christian, I rant and I rave about what happened on the news this week. And that stupid idiot who did this over here, and this over here that did that, and, and, and they come, and they're coming up lame. And what am I doing to keep them from being dislocated? Am I becoming an obstacle myself that needs to be cleared from their path? At the very least, my brothers and sisters, let us not become the obstacles. Let us be so filled with Christ and the word of Christ that it dwells in us richly that we are able to sing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That we're to, able to raise each other up in the word of faith and say, hold on. He who promised is faithful. To help clear the path so they can see Christ clearly in front of them. This was Paul the Apostle's heart. His heart was, I want to do nothing that's going to hinder Christ. Nothing. Beloved, you, can, you, can you hear this? I hope you can hear this with me and say, yes. I want that. I want both sides of it. I want my knees strengthened and I want to be the brace for others too. I want both of that. I, I want to help when my I want to help when my faith is strong, and I want to be helped when my faith is weak. So how do we do that? How can we do that? How about we keep reading the text? Pursue peace with all people. And holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Same verb, two objects. Pursue is the verb for both objects. Pursue peace, pursue holiness. Pursue peace with everyone, horizontal relationships. Pursue holiness with God, vertical relationship. Pursue peace, pursue holiness. The pursuit of holiness is really important. We're going to get to this in a moment. But he attaches that little phrase to that one particularly. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, let's think about pursue peace and how this actually braces and strengthens the grip and clears out the obstacles of the potentially defecting member. Now, the text says pursue peace with everyone, with all, it assumes all people, but context here, I think, strongly implies the application is among the church. Pursue peace with all God's people. Every one of God's children, even the weird and annoying ones. You say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if there are any weird and annoying ones. Well, then you probably are the weird and annoying one. The reality is we're all a little bit weird and annoying at times. Pursue peace. The illustration here is of the body. The eye, if the eye refuses food because it looks bad, it is not very tasty looking stuff. The stomach suffers, the muscles fail, I become faint, I stumble, and my knees give out and break. And then the eye cannot look condescendingly on my knees and say, what's wrong with you? Members of the body at war with each other will produce weakness among the whole body and her faith. Each system, each organ is affected by each member. Now, you know that this is not an illustration original with me. 
The apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, gave this same illustration in the book of Corinthians and Romans. He gave these illustrations of the idea of the body, every member's significance. Because, not, not because every member contributes something in and of itself. It's not that the eyes are significant because they're pretty. It's the idea that the, the, the idea of a body is the whole system relies upon each member. Each member is significant as it relates to the whole, as it relates to the system, right? And this is the illustration the Apostle Paul uses concerning the church life. The whole body matters because the eye in its condescension and its war with the stomach will destroy the knees. And some might say, but the knees have no parts in the eye relationship between the eye and the stomach, but they're affected by it. Paul the Apostle said this as well, which is why when he wrote a letter to a church, he told the church to help Yodius and Syntyche to get along in the Lord. Help them, he told the church, because you're hurt by their war. You're affected by their war. So pursue peace in the body of Christ. Members of Christ's body at war with each other will produce weaknesses among the whole of Christ's people. Each member and system will be affected and some will take steps toward apostasy and defection from Christ because peace was not pursued among the body of Christ. Very briefly, how do we pursue peace? I, I just wrote down six very rapid-fire thoughts of how to pursue peace. We do not have, don't have time. I have scripture for each one of these. I don't have time to turn to them because I want us to look at pursue holiness here before we're done. But how? How can we practically pursue peace in Grace Baptist Church, this body here? How do we do that? First... We've got to stop making judgments about each other. Hypocrisy in our judgment is death to peace among Christ's body. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. We've got to stop making judgments about each other. We have to resist that urge to become irritated and make determinations about that person's character, life, whatever, because of what we have observed in some superficial way. Two, we must make gentle and humble reconciliation primary. We must make gentle and humble reconcili reconciliation primary especially when we come together in worship. Matthew 5, 21 through 24 says that if you come to worship God and you have something against your brother, leave your gift, your sacrifice at the altar. Go reconcile with your brother. Then come back and offer your gift on the altar. Make reconciliation primary. Matthew 18, 15 through 17, Jesus taught the disciples this extensive, how do you do this when it's hard? Well, you start this way. He got, he got very ABC-like level in Matthew 18. You start this way. You, you get up from your chair and you go talk to him. And you say, this is how you've sinned against me. And you want him to hear you. And if he, so you want to say it in such a way and prove it in such a way that he'll hear you. So if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he doesn't hear you, well, then you need to take a few more people and you need to go to him and say, this, brother, this is how you've wronged me from the word of God. And if he refuses in his arrogance to hear you again, you, 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 with those witnesses, you help that. And if he's still there, you take everyone in the church to him. The whole assembly you take to him and say, this is how you've wronged. And if he still refuses them, at that point you have no choice but to treat him as a sinner and out of the church. But why this whole long process? Because we're doing everything we can to make reconciliation primary. We have to do that. 
Third, consider humility in service to your brother and sister as your greatest calling of Christ-likeness. Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says, have this mind of Christ. What is that mind? Look not on your own things, but everyone look or consider the things of others. Not just that you would look at each other eye to eye, but look up to each other from your humbled position. In other words, he says, consider everyone better than yourselves. Don't say, hey, we're all, we're, all, we're all equals here. No, you're better than me. That's what he's saying there. That's the way Christ is. Because how did Christ view his disciples at the very end before his crucifixion? He got on his knees and he washed their feet and he looked up to them. The Lord of the universe considered them more worthy than him in that moment, which is a mind-blowing thing in his humanity. It's just part of the mystery of the divine and human how the Lord could wash the feet of the disciples. He says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. Four, be happy. Look for opportunity to let go of your Christian rights and preferences for the sake of your brother. Romans 14, one through four. Five, put the spiritual physical, emotional, and mental needs of others above your own. Romans 12, 9 through 13 says this. Bear each other's burdens. Forbear one another. Give in. And number six, Romans 12 again, this whole passage, Romans 12, is, is all about this. Never retaliate. Burn your brother embarrass him. In fact, amongst the body of Christ, as a kind of a, a, a term I've used, um, I, I don't know if it makes much sense, but I say when it comes to reconciliation, put the fruit low and pick low-hanging fruit. In other words, your brother has wronged you and you say, you've wronged me, and he goes, oh man, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Take it. <laughs> well, no, no, no. You need to spell out everything you did. Just... We're good. Take the low-hanging fruit and enjoy it. In other words, we let each other save a little face. Right? <laughs> we, we, we're, we're okay. We're, we're ready to reconcile. Never retaliate. Burn your brother or embarrass him. And by the way, you do what you want with this, but every one of these six steps is just as important and commanded on the internet as it is in real life. Just as important. Every command, there's no, Jesus didn't say, now all the things I talk about with gentleness and your speech with grace and season with salt and edification and all that stuff, that does, that's all thrown out of the, that doesn't matter anymore once we get to the internet age. And then you're, it's fair game, burn away. A church that pursues peace with each other, this what was looked at last week, a triune sort of unity, is a church equipped to help the lame in the faith, to hold up weak hands and wobbly knees. The second command, pursue peace, pursue holiness. Now, I think the reason why he adds this little phrase, without which or without holiness, no man will see the Lord, is an emphasis that the pursuit of peace with man never comes at the expense of holiness before God. The pursuit of peace with man never comes at the expense of holiness for before God, nor must we choose amongst the body of Christ, because a pursuit of holiness with God is indeed the most effective way to pursue peace with one another. When we all have the same mind, the mind of Christ, <clears throat> when our unity is in the Word of God and the doctrine of Christ, when we are pursuing the holiness of God, the, the righteousness and justice of God, we will all be in peace as we pursue this holiness. They're not in opposition to each other. It's not peace or holiness, and I have to choose one or the other. 
Peace with each other corporately traces its roots to holiness toward God individually. So here is the individual component of this. This holiness in the context here simply means rightness, godliness, obedience. And the reality is one cannot pursue holiness without pursuing that which is ultimately holy. And there is only one ultimate holy one. The angels cry out day and night, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the holiness of God causes the whole earth to be filled with his glory. Indeed, the glory of God spreading all over the earth through churches and individuals and missionaries is the holiness of God in action. The glory of God is God's holiness spreading. Thus, a pursuit of holiness is a pursuit of God himself and ultimately the one called the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ. Now, the scripture concludes that all who are in Christ are holy and sealed by the Holy Spirit. So if we are holy, how are we to pursue holiness? How does that work? I believe this is a call for us to pursue the practical holiness of thinking and living and activity that follows suit with our holy union in Christ. To live holy actions because of our whole holy identity. We can go back to the body again. If the mouth is impure, covered in sores, so it doesn't eat food. It's not at war with the stomach, it simply can't. The stomach is affected, muscles are affected, knees are weak, and again, a collapse in defection because of the member was unholy, impure. Not only does the body, not, not only must the body of Christ not be at war with each other and pursuing peace, but the body of Christ must be pursuing holiness in their lives Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, pursuing Christ, pursuing God, pursuing the word of holy word of God, the truth, pursuing him so that we do not have a trickle down effect leading toward apostasy, those within the body coming up lame. It's one of the reasons why we have church membership. We're excited with those who are joining with us. And the goal is not only that we would be an encouragement to them, but they would be an encouragement to us, not only through just their gifts and abilities that God has given, but also as they then add another holy strand to the body. And that holy strand of a holy union with Christ lived out in practical holiness and obedience to him and will have a, an effect on me, an effect on you. And it goes back the other way. Now their connection has an effect on them. And as we all are pursuing God and pursuing the ultimate holy one, Jesus Christ, there is the death of apostasy. Apostasy dies amongst the body that is holy. They're healed. So when we do not pursue a holy relationship with the Holy One individually, we damage the holy assembly corporately. I'll say that again. When we do not pursue a holy relationship with the Holy One individually, we damage the holy assembly corporately. How? I just put four down for this one, mostly just for time's sake. But how can we be holy? 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 4, 5. I'd love to go there. Be holy Bible-centered. In First Timothy, or sorry, uh, Second Timothy, chapter four, he talk, three he talks about the inspiration. The Bible is the, the word of God is holy; it's inspired as scripture. And then jumps right into chapter four to say, and we, we must preach this word. And the reason why we must preach this word is because there's coming a time when men will not in, endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers, having their ears to be tickled. They'll heap to themselves teachers, and then it goes on to say that these teachers will lead them from truth. Starts out with the word, the holy word. Be holy 
pursue holiness, pursue the holy word of God. Two, be Holy Spirit dependent. Ephesians 4, 25 through 31 teaches us this as well. It simply is this, when the Holy Spirit moves and works with the holy word, respond. Obey. Do it. Isaiah 6, be sobered and motivated by the knowledge of the Holy One. Read that text, Christian, over and over again in Isaiah 6. That's how you pursue holiness. Become enraptured with the Holy God Himself. Number four, embrace God's gifts as holy and good, but reject all sinful uses and pleasures of those gifts. Hebrews 13, 4 through 5, which we are going to be looking at another sermon, but I just wanted to turn there very quickly because it's right here, says this, marriage is honorable and among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He uses two illustrations there, the sexuality of the marriage life and the, the materialisms of this world, of, of the world that we have, the things we have. And he says, enjoy those things, but in the way that God has given as a holy way. Enjoy the gifts in a holy way, not in a sinful pursuit, not with greed and covetousness and fornication and immorality and so one of the ways we pursue holiness is we embrace the goodness of God we enjoy the good gifts he has given us because they are holy we reject the sinful we push away the immorality the covetousness those things well there's a lot to be said here but I'm out of time so let's just conclude it faith is hard it's hard to run this race it's hard to believe, to trust God. We need each other. We need each other to help strengthen the relaxing hands and to brace up the knees that feel like they're going to blow out and to push the large boulders of whatever it may be, discouragement and sin and just faults. Push those boulders, clear the logs out of the way so we can run together the straight path for our feet. There may be some within this assembly, even today, who are, who are here threatening to come up lame. We don't want anyone to become dislocated out of joint. Rather, we want them to be healed. We want you to be healed in your soul, in your spirit. And so together as a church, can we not commit to then these two pursuits? To pursue holiness with our God in our individual lives through the word and Christ and the spirit. Pursue it. Make it your aim for holiness. And can we not also commit to pursue peace with one another? So that those who are threatened to come up lame will not be dislocated but healed? We wish to all see Christ. Without holiness, no one will see him. We wish to all see him. This will only come when we are in him, the Holy One. Without holiness, no one will see God. Now, I have no holiness inherent within me. I need imputed divine holiness so I can see God. And the evidence of that imputed holiness is practical outworking of holiness. Peace, unity, love for the body of Christ so that's what we are at where we're at today now I know the text keeps going so I'll conclude the sermon with this part two next week